Please be turning your Bibles on over to Exodus chapter 16. Our lesson today will also be our preparation for our communion with the Lord and with each other. You know, I think uh, one of the most exciting things as disciples is the chance not only to study about Jesus in the New Testament, but to understand really the Bible of Jesus in the Old Testament. And so we'll be coming as our main text from Exodus chapter 16. Remember that the Old Testament foreshadows with its physical realities the New Testament's spiritual realities. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I think you understand. First of all, God's people in the Old Testament were the Hebrew people. Amen? Amen. And remember, after a period of time, after Jacob brought everybody to Joseph there in Egypt, they multiplied, multiplied, and multiplied, and they got so numerous that the Egyptians put God's people into slavery. And so the slavery in Egypt represents our old lives, our slavery to sin. You see, the physical foreshadows the spiritual. Then, of course, we remember how Moses led them through the Red Sea on dry ground. Amen? According to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that represents baptism. That's baptism. The physical foreshadows the spiritual. Then, of course, there was the wandering in the desert for 40 years. That's the Christian life. See, a lot of people think the Christian life is the promised land. And they go, well, yeah, yeah, I got baptized. Things should be awesome for me. No, no, that, that's the promised land where milk and honey is at. We're wandering as disciples out there. Then comes the River Jordan. That's death. The physical foreshadowing the spiritual. Then comes the promised land. Heaven. Amen? Now, with that background... Let's go to Exodus 16. Right here we find that the Israelites have just come through the Red Sea. God has delivered them. They've been in the desert wandering now for about 45 days. And we read these words. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of sin. Uh oh, that's, that's not good which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they'd come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of feed and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Now hold it. We just remembered a few moments ago that Egypt was a land of slavery. And now that the Lord has freed them, they've gone through the Red Sea, they've spent 45 days now wandering in the desert, how do they look back at their old lives? They go, oh man, it was so awesome. We always had all the meat we wanted to eat. It was incredible. That's how a lot of us are as disciples. We start getting going as disciples. We're out there in the desert of sin, and we start thinking our old life looks good. We lose our perspective of how rotten and empty the old life was. Well, same thing happened right here. Amen? Yeah. Let's keep reading. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough food for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they'll follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they'll prepare what they are to bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. Well, this is kind of cool. God says, hey, I'm going to take care of you even in the desert. I'm going to rain down bread from heaven Six days, you can collect it each day. But on the sixth day, you'll be able to gather twice this month to be able to take care of you on the Sabbath, the seventh day. Well, keep reading. Verse 6. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was I, the Lord, who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he's heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? 
Moses also said, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You're not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Wow, this is a challenging passage right here. Moses confronts the Israelites. Hey, you're grumbling against my leadership, but you're really grumbling against the Lord. Now, we understand there's no such thing as a perfect leader. And every leader is just a regular disciple who likewise needs to be challenged about his or her life. Are you with me right here? But bottom line, we need to respect those in leadership because when we grumble against the leadership, we are in fact doing what? Grumbling against the Lord. Let's read on. Verse 9. Then Moses told Aaron, say to the entire Israelite community, come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked towards the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared in the desert floor. Frosted flakes right there, okay? When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? For they didn't know what it was. Huh. Moses said to them, It is the bread of the Lord he has given you to eat. This is what the Lord commanded. Each one is to gather as much as he needs. Take an omer for each person that you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it out by the omer, he who gathered much didn't have too much, and he who gathered little didn't have too little. Each one gathered as much as he needed. Now that's pretty awesome. Amen, church? Then Moses said to them, no one's to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until the morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. See, the Lord had told Moses, just tell the people just a very simple, simple teaching. Go out, get the frosted flakes, collect them as much as everybody needs, but don't keep them until the next day. Why? Because they're going to turn to maggots and they will flat out stink. Okay? Well, let's keep going. Each morning, everyone gathered as much as he needed. And when the sun grew hot, it melted away. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much, two omers for each person. And the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. He said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever's left and keep it until morning. So they saved until the morning, as Moses commanded, and it didn't stink or get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is the Sabbath to go to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. Six days you are to gather it, but on the seventh day of the Sabbath, there will not be any. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Verse 31. The people of Israel called the bread manna. It was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made from honey. Verse 35. The Israelites ate manna 40 years until they came to a land that was settled. They ate manna until they reached the border of Canaan. See, to Canaan's land, I'm on my way. That's talking about heaven right there. Amen? The physical foreshadowing of the spiritual realities. Well, our lesson today is just simply entitled Daily Dependence. Because as the Israelites saw right here, it was all about trusting God. All about trusting God. You know, it's, it's an interesting account right here. We find they grumble, but the Lord takes care of their needs. Quail in the evening, and then manna in the morning. So it rained down like dew, and then it dried up with the sun. Remember, they're out in the hot desert, so it probably dried pretty quickly right there. And it dried into these kind of frosted flakes. And they went out that first morning, and all of them went, hey, what is it? The word manna literally means, in Hebrew, what is it? <laughs> well, what are you eating? Some what is it? Now, you know, I have been blessed to have been married over 30 years to, to, to one of the most awesome cooks. 
I think, I, think, I think most of you guys know that Elena's Cuban, so she puts all the Cuban spice into everything. And, and, that's, and that's awesome. And I, and I eat way better than, than I should, as, as you can see. But you know, it wasn't always like that. When we first got married, I remember our, I, I remember, I remember our very first meal. She brought it on out to me and I said, what is it? She says, it's tuna fish casserole. <laughs> oh, okay. The next night, she brought out this naked dish. And I said, what is it? She says, it's tuna fish casserole with peas. I like to have variety. <laughs> now, we, we rotated those two dishes for several days. You know, right here, that's what happened with the Israelites. They walked out, but God was trying to teach them to rely on him every day. See, if they'd go out and try to collect two or three days worth of manna, in the morning it would just stink. It would be rotten. On the other hand, on the Sabbath, the Lord spiritually preserved it. So they collected twice as much. So they would have enough during that day of rest. Our first challenge is daily expectations. Let's go to the book of Psalms. One of my favorite passages is Psalm chapter 5. This is where David talks about his relationship with the Lord. He says in verse 1, Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my sighing. Listen to my cry for help, my King and my God, for to you I pray. In the morning, O oh Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait in expectation. Is that incredible, church? Right here, David says, man, every morning I go before the Lord. And I pray to the Lord. And then I wait in expectations. You know, one of the things that I feel is vital is to have awesome quiet times every morning. You know, the word of God, that's our manna. That's the word of God. And when you have the word of God being ministered to you, you always get enough. And then prayer is where we respond back to God. We lay our requests before him, and then we wait in expectation. You know, it's kind of interesting sometimes we can kind of get in the mindset of, well if I just have one cranking quiet time on Monday then I don't really need much on Tuesday and Wednesday but you know what happens your life starts to stink and get filled with a bunch of maggots you know what I'm talking about right there you know Elaine and I have a little thing going and uh, of course you know we're husband and wife in the Lord but we're also brother and sister in the Lord and, you know, every now and then, you know, we, we may have a little rough morning where we snap at each other. We get a little short. And then usually the question comes, well, honey, have you had your quiet time? Now, either way you go, you're fried. Because if you had, if you had your quiet time, you say, well, why did you fall away so quickly right there? On the other hand, okay, I, go, I need to go have my quiet time. <laughs> you know, I need my quiet time. You know, it makes a difference when you're with the Lord every morning. Are you with me here, church? You know, I mean, I, I, all last week I was praying so hard for our, our, our first church service and everything. And, uh, you know, I, it was just, it was exciting. You know, when, when you're walking with the Lord, it's exciting. Yeah. And I was reading all these scriptures, the book of Acts, about what God's church is really all about. And then only with three-fifths of our mission team here, we had an incredible service last week. 122 people. That was amazing. And when you, when you pray to the Lord and you trust the Lord, you just lay up everything, then you have nothing to worry about. Isn't that what Jesus says? Do not worry, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And everything will be given to you as well. Amen, church? 
You know, I really have to challenge us. How about it, guys? Do we have quiet times that are filled with great expectations? Where we hand over, Lord, all of our worries, all of our concerns. Or do we have one galactic quiet time and then our life starts to stink the next several days because we're really not walking with the Lord. Maybe now we understand the Lord's prayer a little bit better in Luke chapter 11, verses 2 through 4. In one of the verses, Jesus teaches us to, to pray. He says, give us this day our daily bread. You see, for the Jew, he would have remembered the story back in Exodus. See, he would, he would have understood that. And he says, yes, I need to depend. That's how I need to pray is every day to the Lord because he's going to take care of all of my needs. And that's not to say that you just pray one time in the morning and once in the morning does it. I mean, for example, we all eat daily, don't we? And it looks like a lot of us are eating all the way through the day. You know what I'm talking about right here? Well, that's what it is to be with the Lord. It's not a matter you're with the Lord and then you check out. No, a disciple is a son or daughter of God that's walking with the Lord all through the day and all through the night. You see, that's what we learn about daily expectations in our daily walk with God. Turn to Luke chapter 9. Jesus talks about daily Christianity. He says in verse 23, Then Jesus said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Wow. He says, if anyone's to come to me. I guess that includes all of us. He says, here's, here's what you got to do. You got to deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow me. You see, we need to learn to daily bear our crosses. Now that goes so countercultural these days. Where everybody is saying, just listen to your feelings. Express your feelings. If you feel like doing it and it feels good, then go ahead and do it. If you don't feel like doing it, then don't do it. But you know, that's just the opposite of what Jesus is saying right here. Now, Jesus is not saying we don't express our heart. We've already talked about that, how we pour out our heart before the Lord. But we need to understand what one of the most fundamental principles of following the Lord is daily cross-bearing, is self-denial. Are you with me here? Turn to Genesis chapter 39. In Genesis 39, we see a man that I think we can all admire. His name was Joseph. He was going through really tough times. His brothers, out of their bitterness, sold him into slavery. And after a while, he finds himself at the head of Potiphar's house. In the middle of verse 6 of chapter 39, we read these words. Now, Joseph was well built and handsome. Well, now some of us can relate to that. Let me, let me run it by again right here. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. Wow, we just thought that happened in the 21st century. Whoa. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns has been entrusted by care. No one's greater in this house than I am. My master's withheld nothing from me except you because you're his wife. How then can I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day after day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. One day he went out in the house to attend his duties and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. That is a man of conviction right there. He didn't do what he felt like doing. He didn't do what he could have gotten away from with because no one else was around. See, for Joseph, having convictions to deny self was a matter of his relationship with God. 
He explains to this woman, he says, listen, I, I can't do what you, you want me to do. This is a wicked thing. Your husband, my master's put me in charge of everything. He's trusted me. And I will not sin against my God. And you know, Simon, when she came at him again, and let me tell you something, temptation is going to come after you again and again and again and again. Are you with me right here? Sometimes you just got to not bother to explain. It's just time to get out of there. It's time to flee. You know, as disciples, we need to have a deep conviction that sold out disciples date and marry sold out disciples. Let me tell you something. You start getting out there in the world, your convictions are going to dissipate. And you're going to lose the convictions you have and lose sight of God. Turn with me, if you please, to Hebrews chapter 2. Have you ever felt yourself just going through the motions? Look at Hebrews chapter 2. In Hebrews 2 and verse 1, it says, We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we've heard, so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received this just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? Wow. The writer of the Hebrews is addressing something that I believe is, is huge in this day and age. People who once enjoyed their great salvation that have begun to drift away. They've drifted away, not only in life, but in doctrine. They've drifted away. Well, what happens to people that drift away? Well, turn, he addresses it in Hebrews chapter 5, in verse 11. We have much to say about this, but it's hard to explain because you're slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings, or in other translations, the first principles about Christ, and go on to maturity, not laying in the foundations of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instructions about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment, and God permitting we'll do so. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of this coming age, if they fall away to be brought back to repentance because to their loss they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Now right here, we hit some very challenging teachings. The beginning of the book, he talks to the, the Christians that have begun to drift away. And then he addresses people as saying, listen, you ought to be teachers right now. But you need milk, not solid food. There, there's a lot of discussion today. Well, I'm a mature Christian. I'm a mature Christian. And what they do, they pull out their, their Christian card that says, I've been a Christian 10 years. I, I've been a Christian 12 years. I'm mature. No, 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 no. You may be old, but you may not be mature. You may have been around a long time, but you're not mature. So what do you mean? Well, let's go to the book right here. What does the book say about being mature? Number one, the book says to be mature, you've got to desire some meat. You are in the Word, studying it, getting some good meat every day. You know what I'm talking about right here? Number two. You're training yourself to distinguish good from evil. You've got some convictions about following God. And number three, you know the first principles. You're not fuzzy about the laying on of hands or baptisms, who's a Christian, who's saved, or who's lost. You understand that to come to Christ, you have to have faith in Jesus Christ. You've got to repent of your sins. You've got to make the decision to be a disciple, and you've got to be baptized for the remission of sins. That is what the book says. And if you're fuzzy on doctrine, you're not mature. You may have hung around a long time, but you're not mature. Yeah, way up, bro. 
And bottom line, what does a mature person do? He teaches other people about Jesus Christ. That's what a mature person does. You know, uh, I, need, I need to get something out in the open here. About 11 months ago, I was inspired by a certain brother to go on a diet. Yes, Brother Lance Underhill himself. And the name of the diet was Body for Life. And I'll never forget it. We're, we're there eating the sushi and stuff. And I'm talking about, you know, yeah, I really feel like I go go and die. Oh, bro, I've got a great diet. Whoops out his wallet and takes out these two pictures. Bro, this is me before. I go, whoa. <laughs> this is me after. I go, well, oh, that's not bad for three months. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that diet. And Lance says, I'm going to help you. I said, hey, man, I need all the help I can get. And so I, I did it. And, you know, after about uh, six months, I, I'd lost 30 pounds. I went from 220, and I'm embarrassed to say it down to 190. And, and, and for me, that was cranking. Well, then I felt like I could handle just a little dessert because it was, it was, it was body for life. And I started having, you know, some mashed potatoes and maybe a little bit of extra starch and couple desserts and I and I and I no 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 we didn't we didn't have that uh, and I and I and I began to drift away I drifted and I drifted but you would if you would have asked me the last couple months bro are you dieting yes I'm watching my diet I'm trying to eat a lot of fish and chicken. But I, unbeknownst, this is, this is amazing, unbeknownst to me. Now, when we got to California, you know how Californians are, you know, they're, they're too body conscious, that's the truth. But on the other hand, you know, you don't like your T-shirt sticking out. You know what I'm talking about? And I go, you know something? I need to check out where I'm at. I got on the scales a couple days ago, 207. I go, gee, Christmas. You know, I had, I had to come to some grips. I thought I was only drifting a little, that I was just, had drifted away. I'd fallen away. And my life showed it. And so did my belly. <laughs> now, I say all that to say this. There are many people that were apart of our former fellowship that in their minds were just drifting away a little. They saw the imperfections, they saw the mistakes, and I believe every disciple and every leader needs to own up to their sins and their mistakes. But as I look around, I, I see people that have drifted so far away that they're fuzzy on the doctrine. They don't have a distinct daily Christian life that's teaching other people. In fact, they're not a drift away, they're a fall away. You know, when, I don't know about you, I was like, wow, when Robin Burgundy got up here, that took a lot of guts. You know, they used to lead the AMS in the Honolulu Church. See, Burgundy thought that her husband had, yeah, he'd fall away, he needed to be restored. But when the scriptures were opened up, said, well, now are you living daily for the Lord? And then it hit her when she looked at the scriptures. I'm not a drift away. I'm a, I got to be restored. And that's why you saw all the tears. You know, I've got I've to challenge you. Are you a drift away? Or have you drifted so far away? You're a fall away, and you don't even know it. See, we've got to have a conviction about daily carrying our cross and daily denying ourselves. Amen? Yeah. Let's go to Acts 2.
In Acts 2, we have a picture of God's first church. What an incredible thing. We read in verse 41, those who accept this message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to the number of that day. Is that incredible or not, guys? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship to bring bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. Many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. They broke, together, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You know, right here, we see that the early church had daily relationships. I mean, the Bible says right here, they got baptized and they devote themselves, first of all, the apostles' teaching, the word of God, amen, guys? And they devote themselves to the fellowship. They devote themselves to breaking the bread. That's, that's communion, but communion is a meal. And they devote themselves to prayer. It says every day they were meeting together. Every day they're breaking bread in their homes. I mean, that's the kind of church that we're striving to be here at the City of Angels Church. We want to be a Bible church. And so we call each of our members to live by the scriptures and have daily relationships. Turn to Hebrews chapter 3. In Hebrews 3 and verse 12 we read, See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Wow. Now, look at what, let's see if we can break it down. He says, we got to be careful of having a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Amen? Yeah. Well, at what period of time do we need to be concerned about that? Every day. <laughs> I mean, every, every day is another chance to fall away. But encourage one another daily as long as it's called day, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. That's the drifting, and then we become deceived, and then after a period of time we fall away. Is that challenging? I think so. See, one of the things that we are committed to in this congregation is being best friends. Now, our friendship is not first and foremost. Our first and foremost relationship is with the Lord. And then the Lord brings us together. Even on Sundays, you know, when the last amen is said and the last song is said, we love to hang around. We love then to go out to eat. We're not trying to beat the Baptist over the Burger King. That's not what we're trying to do. We are committed. We are devoted to the fellowship. You know, so, some have said in the past, well, you know, I just... I just don't feel like going Wednesday nights. You don't feel like going? Well, tell it to your boss on Monday morning. You don't feel like going to work. You do it because it's a commitment, amen? But when you get that paycheck, you're feeling pretty good about your commitment, amen, guys? See, when you do right, you'll be rewarded with the feelings. But so often, we want our feelings to guide us, and then we don't end up doing right. We need to understand, yes, as a church, we have commitment. We meet together on Sunday morning. It's not something that we got to do. It's something that we love to do. We meet together at midweek, every other week, men and women. It's awesome. We have every member involved in a Bible talk where we want to bring as many friends as possible to hear about the Lord. And then we have extracurricular events like on Saturday we climbed Mount Hollywood. That was cranking. That was a bonding experience right there as we sweated together. I mean, what I really appreciate, though, some of the brothers not only climbed Mount Hollywood, but then they went out all the way to Ventura and moved in the Woodchecks and moved in the Batsons and moved in another non-member. And they, and they loved it. They were fired up. See, as disciples, we love being together. It's flat awesome. And when you have that kind of relationship, you got to love one another. And when you love one another, when non-Christians walk in, you go, wow, I've never seen anything like this. You guys are all so different. But you love each other. Only one explanation. God. God. See, I married my wife 30 years ago. That was a commitment I made. 
That was a commitment she made. And there have been times that I've maybe not been the most lovable. You know, good looks does not get you by all the time. Being well built just doesn't hack it all the time. Because sometimes, you know, you don't act very Christian, but she has a commitment. I have a commitment. It's not based on feelings, but let me tell you something. I've never felt more love for my wife than I have at this hour. When you're committed to each other and you go to hell and you assault the very gates of hell together, let me tell you something. There's a bond right there. And then there's love. That's what true love is all about. You know, we really believe in discipling relationships in the church here. We believe that we are called to disciple one another. Turn to Matthew chapter 28. In Matthew 28, this is after the resurrection. Jesus says in verse 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And when you make a statement like that, you're about to lay out some cranking something. You know what I mean? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Okay. What do you want me to do? <laughs> Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you to the very end of the age. You know, right here, we're commanded to go and make disciples. No one is born a disciple. We all have to be made into a disciple. And so that takes a lot of humility. Because in order to be made into a disciple, you've got to humble yourself before someone that's imperfect. See, that's the glory of God. He uses imperfect folks like you and me to make disciples for him. Is that cool or not? That, that should give you a tingle down your back to think, wow, God, God uses in imperfect people like me. But there's no question this scripture teaches that we are to make disciples. Not only do we baptize disciples, but look what he says after they're baptized. We are to teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. See, discipling is an ongoing process. It's not once you're a disciple, then you're having more discipling. No, 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 no. Yes, discipling starts when you first study in the Bible. But discipling should go on all the way to heaven. Amen, guys? So here in the congregation, our methodology is to have discipleship partners. And, of course, the Bible teaches certainly in a student-teacher relationship. I mean, that's, that's what you have when you first get baptized. You, you have a teacher, you have a student. Now, over time, that relationship is going to shift into, instead of kind of a parent-child relationship, it's going to shift into more an adult-adult relationship. But I don't think it's a matter of a peace-peace relationship. It's, it's a matter of really being involved in each other's lives, where you're confessing sin, you're open, you're dealing with your life, you're asking questions. This is what discipling is all about. We all need discipling. Sadly, many places are teaching that discipling is optional or discipling is bad. They say, oh, no, I, I don't want to be involved in discipling because I got hurt in discipling. Well, let's, let's break this down a second. Because you got hurt in discipling, you are now saying discipling is bad. Let's think for a second. How about marriage? Marriage was made in the Garden of Eden, was it not? Therefore, it's perfect. But isn't it amazing that when two people marry and they love each other more than either person in the whole world, that after five years, 10 years, 15 years, they hate each other more than anybody in the world? So are we then to draw the conclusion that marriage is bad. Now, some people have to say, I'm never going to marry. No, that's not right. Marriage is perfect. Why do you get hurt in marriage? Because you married another sinner. <laughs> and you know what sinners do best? Sin. Stay sin. Now you have discipling relationships. Discipling is of God. Jesus taught it. It was how they were going to evangelize the world. But when you put two people together in a discipling relationship, when you put two sinners together in a discipling relationship, what's going to happen? Sin, you're going to get hurt. 
But that doesn't mean the discipling relationship is wrong. It's the hearts of the people. Are you with me right here, guys? And as a church, we need to have a deep conviction that we need to be discipled. When you have that humble heart and you're inviting people into your life, then others will want you in their life. You see, we need daily relationships. Amen? Amen. Let's go to Acts chapter 5. In Acts 5, the apostles are being tried before the Sanhedrin. And we read this in, in verse 40. Gamaliel's speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing. That's how it needs to be in these days. Amen, church? Amen. See, the example of the apostles, which was the example of Jesus, was that they preached everywhere, every day, to everyone. That was their passion. Everywhere, every day, to everyone. You know, it, it's exciting. Those of us that have come down, there are about 42 of us that have come down from Portland uh, on the mission team. There's still about uh, seven or eight that, that are coming, so pray for Nick and company. Amen. Amen. But we, we've come, and you know, when, whenever you move someplace on a mission team, it just, it just kind of clears out the clutter in your life. And, and you remember, I know why I'm here. I'm not here to enjoy the, the beautiful palm trees and the sun and the smog. I'm not here to do that. I'm here, to quote the, the Blues Brothers, on a mission from God. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here on a mission from God. And you know, what I've found is that most people are not thinking about, oh man, I have emptiness in my life because I don't know if I'm going to go to heaven. Most people have emptiness in life because they have no sense of purpose. And that's what's awesome about being a disciple of Jesus Christ. You live every day for God, and you're just looking for people to help. Yeah. And it's kind of fun to see who the Lord's going to send your way. Yeah. You know, as a church, I have to challenge this. You know, hey, we got Easter next week. Amen, guys? And if there's one day the world feels guilty about not going to church on, it's Easter Sunday. I mean, you're talking about it's just out there for the pickings this next week right there. Hey, you got to come to church. Oh, no, I don't know. It's Easter Sunday. Okay, I will. Amen. <laughs> we can pack out this place, guys. Yeah, we'll do it. But we've got to be like Jesus. We've got to be like the apostles. Everywhere, every day, to everyone. Are you with me right here? Yes. See, we need to have daily evangelism. Yes. You know, the old story is, is that, hey, I'm a fisherman. Well, how many fish have you caught? None. How often do you go fishing? Well, I really don't. It's been a few years. Well, then, are you really a fisherman if you never go fishing? Are you really a disciple if you never go fishing? You have to think about it. The scriptures call us to daily evangelism. Let's close out in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This passage right here is just so encouraging. We're going to talk about daily renewal. You know, when you're daily walking with Lord, having daily expectations, with daily bearing your cross, with daily relationships, with daily evangelism, you need some daily renewal. You know what I'm talking about? Let's pick it up in verse 7, chapter 4. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. Let's just stop right there. The treasure is our salvation. The jar of clay is, is these bodies. Now, some of us, like me, got the rounded kind of jars. You know what I'm talking about right here? doesn't make a difference what kind of jar you got. It's fragile. It's fragile. God meant for your body to be fragile because he wants you to understand you got to depend on him, right? Let's read again here. 
But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Does that inspire you right there? We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus. Remember, you got to die to yourself, self-denial. So that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal bodies. So that death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. He's saying, I die to myself so I can give you life. Verse 13. It's written, I believe, therefore I've spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that's reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Does that fire you up right now? I mean, I mean, last week, I mean, wasn't it awesome to see Carlos and Myrna restored to the Lord? I mean, this week, it was, it was so <laughs> incredible to, to see the Onikeas and to be able to see Maria restored. I mean, the tears. There was sadness over, yeah, they're drifting and they're falling away, but they were just happy to be back. And, and I don't know, I sat there today, I was just, I was just thinking, I was a man, I'm, I'm just thankful to be a bunch, with a bunch of Christians that are just fired up. And so fired up, they're willing to deny themselves to help other people come back to God. You know, I know it's not going to be very long before, you know, Jared's going to be baptized. Amen? I mean, you know, it's awesome. You know, Jared, he came here a little bit hard-hearted with mom and dad. The McGee's are, are away this weekend. And but what's awesome, he's, you know, what he's done? He made a mistake. He started hanging around disciples. You know, the darndest thing happens when you hang around disciples. You start wanting to be one. And, and, you know, we got together the other day, and, and Jared's a very open fellow, and he just said, he just kept, here's my challenges, blah, blah, blah. I says, well, dude, you need to get in the Word. You need to really draw close to God, and you need to spend time with the disciples. And he spent Friday night, I guess, with some of the brothers out there in Hollywood. And, and when he came to, to Mount Hollywood, to, 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 like, I mean, he, you, I could just see the transformation in his eyes. The lights were on. You know what I'm talking about right here, guys? I mean, and, 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 and it, just, it just means so much to be able to see people's lives transformed. To be able to see people being restored to the Lord. People being baptized. People that have walked away from our former fellowship saying, Wow, I found it. This is the church I was baptized in. This is awesome. This is incredible. But see, guys, we need to be thankful to God because of these things. Now look at the closing passage. Therefore, this is because we're thankful to God, because we see so many people's lives being transformed, because we're dying to self so that others can live. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Have you ever noticed that when you're not involved in people's lives, helping to become disciples, you begin to lose heart because you become focused on all your problems? And I, I'll tell you something. When you start studying with non-Christians, you see their problems. You're going, man, my problems are nothing. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, people get themselves into the most ridiculous messes. And you go, wow, I'm lucky. I'm a disciple. Amen. <laughs> Therefore, we don't lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles, that's what this life is all about. Just a light, momentary trouble. That's what pain in the rain is. Just a light, momentary trouble. That's what being cursed out on the interstate is. Just a light momentary trouble. <laughs> Achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not in what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. You know, uh, I'm 52 now, creeping up on 53. That's what happens to 52-year-olds. And one of the things, uh, it's, 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 it's a funny sadness that I have 
too many mornings is I look at my pillow and there's a couple hairs. And you say, that's, that's stupid. Not if they're your hairs, let me tell you something. You know, I've gotten to a point now where I have to be very careful how I comb. The part's gone a little bit further over. We've got to glean a little bit more on over right here. And, 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 and it is funny, you know, as, as we age, and, and some of the others that, that, that are aging along with me. <laughs> we see now your pillow's empty, so, you know, I mean. <laughs> Losing, losing your, there, there's a sadness there, but there's an intent. You know, when you buy a car, it's not going to last you a lifetime. They got it rigged, so about four, five, six years down the line, you're going to buy another one. See, the reason you get sick, the, the reason you have physical trauma, the reason that you start sagging, the reason you have wrinkles, the reason you start losing your hair, is that God has rigged it that way. Because he has given us a slow warning. You're not going to be here forever. I think that's awesome. I think it's awesome. I mean, what if we'd just all be good looking, then we'd all fall off. I mean, no warning. But we get to see the wrinkles, and get to see the little bald spots, get to see the things sagging a little on the side. And you go, dang, that's not good. I better be doing good spiritually. <laughs> and then you start going, you know, my troubles, wow, they're just kind of light momentary things. Because what I'm all about is I, I'm, I'm living this life for the Lord. See, that's what God was trying to teach the Israelites. Hey. Every morning, guys, frosted flakes. <laughs> I want to teach you to depend on me. And when you depend on the Lord, and I challenge you to try it, you start having cranking quiet times every day this week, I promise you renewal. No, the hair doesn't grow back. I'm not talking about that. But I promise you renewal. I promise you, you'll begin to be transformed. For some that have drifted away, you'll find your first love again. Your spiritual heart will start beating. And you'll remember that this life, those things that we see mean nothing. For it's the unseen that are eternal. Thank you, and God bless.